No doubt about these. All the flowers on Europe's wild islands arrived from somewhere else. Hydrangeas came from Asia. Natural boundaries between fields. They're a symbol of the Azores. Hundreds of stone walls create hundreds of microclimates for the vines the settlers brought in the 15th century. Four hundred years later, the vineyards were abandoned as islanders left for America. The stone walls became a playground for Madeira lizards. They were brought here by seafarers too. Azores wines are now fashionable again. Nearly a thousand hectares, more than two thousand acres of ancient vineyards on the island of Pico have been declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. The ruts of ox carts, once the island's only transport. They dragged firewood and building materials for houses and stone walls. And they carried the new wines down to the coast to ship to Europe, but at a cost. Beneath these waters is the strangest, most dangerous place on the Azores. They call it the Anchor Graveyard. Scores of great iron anchors lying on the seabed. When an Atlantic storm hit, the only way to save your ship from the rocks was to cut the anchor rope fast and dash for the open sea. The iron left behind has become a rusting reef for a multitude of creatures. These anchors are coated by algae and tube worms. A shark's outline protects hiding fish. The grim-looking sea robin feels its way. The three front spines of its pectoral fins have their own receptor cells for finding food. The Mediterranean moray's mouth is mournful, but it's miming the call of the sea robin's swim bladders. A common octopus discreetly searches for food. It will fit in anywhere. while bearded fireworms clear up the corpses in the anchor graveyard. They are the mobile relatives of the immobile tube worms. The octopus has found another spot to test its camouflage skills. Above water too, human presence is everywhere, even in the craters. Any straight line means a wall, one that protects the grazing horses and cattle. By keeping the grass short, these domestic animals help the seasonal visitors that have been coming here for thousands of years. The ruddy turnstone digs to find fresh food. Black-bellied plover fly in from Russia on their way to their winter quarters in South America and South Africa. The ruddy turnstone drops in from the Arctic. The northern wheatear arrived from Canada by Greenland. The American pipit drifted in from North America. 
The blackbird? Well, it's here all year round. It's an endemic variety. The male is darker and glossier than its mainland cousin. Birds have to transport their own weight. A little body can be a big advantage on a long journey. But weight doesn't matter to other migrants. They're supported by water. Humpback whales migrate between the Arctic and the tropics. They make a hunchback when they dive, hence the name. A pod of fin whales, the blue whale's closest relatives, the two species can interbreed. They swim back and forth between Arctic and subtropical waters. Fin whales and blue whales have their blowhole in the center of their skulls. Sperm whales have theirs on the left. Baleen whales spend long periods sieving krill and plankton from the waters of the Azores. They leave their excreta behind them. It feeds vegetable phyloplankton. Animal plankton eat the phyloplankton, and at the other end of the food chain are fish and the whales themselves. But a great deal of whale food comes from deeper down. Meanwhile, not all the creatures of the eternal darkness are permanently banished to the depths. Every night, countless organisms leave the realm of the bizarre anglerfish and rise into shallower waters. Colossal amounts of krill join them on the upward journey. A nightly vertical migration. Salps and bioluminescent comb jellies illuminate the greatest movement of biomass on Earth. All here to harvest the vegetable plankton or get eaten themselves. This innocent looking blob is anything but. A Portuguese man of war is a colonial organism, a conglomeration of polyps serving different functions. One polyp is the sail. Innumerable other polyps repel invaders or catch booty with tentacles that stretch up to 30 meters. On the right, a salp has become ensnared. Venom from stinging cells kills the prey. The tentacles drag it to the mouth. Salps are tunicates, or sea squirts, more closely related to us than to jellyfish. Delicate bands of muscle rhythmically contract, pumping water through the salp's body, filtering its food. Salps build into chains and can direct themselves through the water. be up to a meter or longer. Unlike salps, 
Many jellyfish have venomous tentacles, but they too have predators. They're one of the favorite foods of loggerhead sea turtles. On their five-year journey from the Florida beach where they were born, they swallow innumerable jellyfish immune to the venom. But there's another hitch. Comb jellies have no sting cells, but in the water they look a lot like drifting plastic. And that's the problem. The turtles try to eat plastic, and it kills them. This is a great jellyfish hunter. At up to three meters in length, the ocean sunfish particularly relishes the Portuguese man of war. But that too catches other jellyfish. The sunfish can dive. This heaviest of all bony fish tears its prey apart in the depths. The man of war must stay on the surface, but it's a most effective hunter. The quarry's sheer water also has a successful strategy, at least in its familiar world. It deposits its eggs in niches high on the rocky cliffs. No surf, no high tide can reach its young. But now, they face a new danger. Stray cats. The female shearwater laid a single egg in May. Pity there's only one. Looks like a bad strategy now. They can't adapt to an unwanted gift brought by humans. On the island of Corvo, more than 80% of predated chicks are the victims of cats. There's nothing the adult birds can do. They spend the whole day out over the sea. By contrast, periphyton a mix of algae, bacteria and microbes stay where they grow. Ruled by time and tide. Some quickly find a home on flotsam and jetsam. Attached and yet mobile, they drift across the ocean. Goose barnacles fix onto hard surfaces. Their cirri grasp plankton from the water. No matter what it's made of, marine debris attracts life forms. One of the ocean's fastest swimmers likes to stay close to flotsam, the mahi mahi. because floats and buoys provide protection in the open sea. Some species may have survived ocean transfer as passengers on floating debris. When sheer water breed, dusk brings a deafening chorus. Parent birds calling to their young as they return from the sea. The birds recognize each other's cries. 75% of all the world's shearwaters breed in gigantic colonies on the Azores. The name Madeira lizard says it all. This creature originated on a distant island. 
The Madeira wall lizard is very common on the Azores. It's one of the few reptiles found on these islands and it's very fond of nectar. Invertebrates and vegetable matter complete its diet. Just across the bay is the domain of a giant. This is the whale shark. The world's biggest fish. That's what 12 meters of muscle and cartilage say about the whale shark. Like mobular rays, it's mainly a plankton eater, but also eats crustaceans and small fish. Rays rolled fins on their foreheads direct the plankton into their mouths. Mobular rays are part of the manta ray family. They cruise in small groups shadowed by fish using them as cover and picking up their leftovers. Flying in slow motion, the rays dance through the ocean, round the volcanoes. High above, there's something stirring on the cliffside. A Cory's shearwater leaves the nest niche for the first time. He doesn't know a thing about flying, but his parents have stopped feeding him. He has to learn to fly as fast as possible, or he'll never have a meal again. He needs a takeoff point with a fair wind. Even on the rocks, he looks unsteady. A fellow shearwater learns the difference between flying and falling. If you're already on the surface of the sea, there's nowhere further to fall. But getting aloft is even more difficult. Wings over water, that's the right idea. Taking off from the sea in a side wind, tough even for the experienced. It's now or never. Pluck up your courage. Embrace the wind and off to South America. On the Azores, you're either coming or going. In December, with the sheer waters long gone, male sperm whales are returning from their feeding grounds in the Arctic waters. They meet males who were too young to make the journey and mothers with their young calves born while they were away. While the mother dives for food, her calf stays on the surface. It'll be two years before he dives with the group. Whales will seek giant squid at a depth of a thousand meters. At 18 meters and weighing in at 50 tons, sperm whales are the world's biggest toothed whales. The calf will remain alone for up to an hour, defenseless against a possible attack by killer whales.
Finally, the group returned from the deep. The calf is once more under the protection of its mother. She will feed it for two years. During this time, she won't fall pregnant. Now the whales can take their ease, preferably hanging vertically in the water. Someday the calf will join the long migration to the Arctic before returning to Europe's wild islands, the Azores.